Thank you, Jim. Okay, I'm gonna have it back here, is that okay? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this lovely spring evening. Uh, my name is Sandy Krause. I've been the pro pro program's chair for the last two years. Um, we're looking for someone to replace me for next year, so if anybody wants that job, please let somebody know. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I just have an a couple of announcements. Um, first, I wanted to thank the Glendora Public Library and the Glendora Library Friends Foundation for partnering with us to offer our free historical programs here in the Big Forum throughout the year. Um, our final program is scheduled for May 23rd, that's also a Monday at the same time, and the program is still to be announced. I have to figure that out still. Um, okay, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. Gary Stickle. Uh, Dr. Gary Stickle is an archaeologist who has had worldwide and unique experiences with major sites and research. He received his PhD in anthropology, specializing in archaeology from UCLA in 1974. He taught at UCLA both in the Department of Anthropology and more recently on the UCLA Extension staff at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. He also worked as a research associate in isotope laboratory at the UCLA Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics, where he personally conducted the radiocarbon dating technique on samples from around the world. Some of his major expeditions and projects have included his excavation of Achillion, the legendary birthplace of Achilles of the Trojan War in Greece, in the Greek islands. In Peru, he conducted an excavation at Machu Picchu, the lost city of the Incas. He has been involved with California archeology span since 1965 and was given directorship of his first excavation in 1966 by the UCLA Archaeological Survey. Since then, he has conducted major excavations in California, such as at the Spanish mission of San Buenaventura, and more recently at the Far Point Clovis culture site in Malibu, the oldest site in this area at 13,000 years before present. Dr. Stickle has published books and monographs and has authored technical articles in major books and journals of archaeology and anthropology. Currently, Dr. Stickle is the official tribal archaeologist of the original Indians of the Los Angeles and Orange County areas, the Quiche tribe, also known as Gabrielino after the San Gabriel mission. He is engaged in several projects. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lost it completely. How's that? Um, okay, I don't know how that happened. Um, let's see. He is engaged in several projects on their behalf. In 2013, he co authored with the Kitsch a book on their heroine entitled Toy Purina, the Joan of Arc of California, which has been well received by academic and the public and also will be on sale today if anybody wants to purchase that. She is the only Native American woman who ever led a revolt in American history. Uh, Dr. Stickle was used by Lucas Films as a consultant for their Indiana Jones series, which is why the London Times, um, when announcing the discovery of the Far Point Clovis site to the world, called him the real life Indiana Jones. Please help me welcome Dr. Stickle. I hope this thing works. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I hope Lucas film with the Indiana Jones series, but I'd like to say only the nerdy parts of Indiana Jones. <laughs> I don't carry a whip, although the secretary I had one time bought me a whip. I think there's a mixed message there. <laughs> I thought it was a better boss than that, but whatever. You know. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm uh, really honored to be here this evening, and I'd like to thank um, Dr. Han Poisson, who recommended me to the uh, Glendora Historical Society. I want to thank Sandy Cross for uh, calling me and uh, inviting me. That was great. And uh, I liked her town. I've been going here a lot, meeting with Dr. Han Poisson, and getting uh, terrific inputs from her. And uh, we have some tribal members here tonight. They're over here in an area led by uh, Henry Petragon. Henry, raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, Henry has a few books uh, to sell if you'd like to buy a book about our hero, Toy Marina. 
also want to introduce uh, Arthur McGevrov back there. Raise your hand, Arthur. Okay. And, uh, came, came on the spot, and uh, he's been helping me with a lot of uh, terrific work on tribal matters. He's also been uh, asked to be a tribal monitor for projects you know, by the tribe, so that's great. Okay, um, see if my thing is, oh, there it is, okay. This is uh, the emblem and the logo of the tribe. Um, and I just want to explain it briefly because it used to be different. Uh, I illustrated the house here. That's a traditional house that they had called a quiche. So the actual name of the tribe is after their uh, houses. So they like to call themselves the people of the willow and thatched houses. Um, that name, by the way, I want to mention that no uh, California Indian tribe, um, well, look who showed up here. <laughs> um, no California Indian tribe had a pan-tribal name for the tribe. Uh, like the Chumash, that name comes from uh, Santa Cruz Island, the Chumash. It's not a pan-tribal name. The same thing with the quiche. So this is confusing, it's especially confusing to Europeans and Americans who have to have a name for the entire area, okay, of people. And uh, uh, the analogy is the Kish identified themselves with the village that they were living in. So if you're from Topanga, Tabanga, you're Tabanga beat, a person of Tabanga. If you're from Kawanga, same thing. Tahunga, or we have a, a tribal associate, uh, Victoria, all the way from Rancho Cucamonga, which is named after the village of Cucamonga. So whenever you hear that NGA ending, you know you're dealing with a Kish village. You know, it's a remnant name of that. Uh, the reason they uh, like Kish as a tribal name is when the Spanish first arrived here in, in uh, 1771, they went to an area called Winter Narrows, which I'll show you on a uh, subsequent map here in a second. Uh, and they did so because it was well watered by the San Gabriel River, but it was also heavily populated with many villages. And the Spanish, frankly, used those villages as slave labor to build the first mission. That first mission was not located where it is today in the city of San Gabriel. It's located at what's called Whittier Narrows. Uh, I want to mention that because there's a number of gentlemen here who are part of the Save Whittier Narrows Society um, group. You want to raise your hands, guys? Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, because uh, they want to build a, a museum for water there, destroy this beautiful natural area that the tribe wants to preserve because it is their sacred center. Kish Namakin, the sacred center of the Kish. Uh, so I've been helping to fight to uh, try to save that and preserve it. Uh, so the Spanish initially called them Kish because that's what they call themselves in that area. The people collectively in the Winter Narrows area call themselves Kish. The Spanish uh, Hispanicized it and called them Quichereños, meaning that, in, you know, that suffix like Angelinos, you know. Uh, but then when the mission was moved to San, to the present location five miles north, uh, the Spanish initially called them Quiche. In fact, I just found a publication on this that the tribal chairman, uh, Andy Salas, uh, showed me by a father Sucranus, and he mentioned that initially they were called Quiche. But later on, the Padres at the mission called them Gabrielinos you know, after the San Gabriel mission, and that's what they're best known as. But they prefer not a name given to them by their conquerors. They prefer an ethnic name, Kish. And, and uh, uh, Arthur Becker has been helping me document the fact that uh, 100 years, 150 uh, more years ago, uh, the scholars called them Kish in international publications, uh, the first one being Horatio Hale 
1844, and a government publication on ethnology. And that was followed by uh, Latham in uh, London, Royal Geographical Society, I think, unless I'm forgetting. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so England rec recognized the case, another country. And then there was uh, Johann Buschmann, who was a German ethnographer, and he came among the case and recorded their language and published the vocabulary in the Royal uh, German uh, Society of Science. Okay, a very credible publication. Uh, so Kish is, uh, was prevalent for a hundred years or more. And then there's a famous anthropologist, A.L. Krober, and uh, UC Berkeley, very uh, influential anthropologist. And he wrote a general book, the, the first Bible, if you will, on the California Indians, called The Indians of California. And the chapter he had on uh, the tribe here, he called them Gavilinos, L-I-N-O. And that's interesting that he decided to call them that because in an earlier publication, uh, 1909, I believe it was, um, he called them Kish. So I don't know why he changed. But this guy was so influential that uh, the academics start calling, uh, start calling them Gavilinos instead of Kish. And that's continued until recently, and we're trying to get, get it back to the, the original name. So anyhow, the, the logo, I just want to show you what it represents. Um, these are dolphins, and the uh, tribe believed that uh, dolphins were uh, sacred animals that actually swam around, quote, quote, swam around the world to protect people. So that's why they're on there. Uh, they were on there in the, the previous logo. <laughs> And then, as I mentioned, the, the, the Kish house, which I, I drew. And then these are their traditional artifacts. This, uh, using Spanish terms, is a mano and a matante, like here we have a matante, okay? And, and then behind it is a mortar and a pestle. The mortar is back there on that table, behind the lady. And there's a little pestle right here. This one right here, if you want to see it later. It's nice they brought these artifacts so you can see what scientists would call hard evidence of the presence of the, of the tribe, you know? And then these are actual peach baskets that are uh, based on photographs and stuff like this. And this one is a water bottle. Uh, they would coat those water bottles with asphaltum, like what they would get from the red tar pits and other tar sources. Uh, so they were, they had water bottles. And then this ring, I'll show you in a subsequent uh, photo, uh, is from a basket that's in the Smithsonian Institution. Kish baskets are very rare. They're beautiful, as you'll see, a couple of examples, but they're extremely rare. Uh, and, uh, and then this was suggested by the Tribal Secretary, Dr. Christina Swindoll, and uh, what it is, is archaeologists call this, uh, those kind of artifacts, cock stones, because they look like the gears of a machine. Uh, they're about the size of a donut, most of them, and they have teeth carved into them, squared off teeth around. Uh, but the tribal chairman, uh, Andrew, thinks, and I think he's right, that they are uh, sacred artifacts called sunstones, and they represent the sun deity, Ta'amet, a Ta'amet. Uh, and so what's interesting is a former student of mine um, uh, tried to publish an, uh, an article on, uh, and I'm blanking her name, it's embarrassing, you know, <laughs> but hopefully it'll come to me in a second, um, that, uh, to show the distribution of these cock stones. And she didn't note this, but I noted that the distribution of cock stones coincides with the tribal area, the tribal territory, the entire tribal territory of the Kish. And so it is what archeologists would call a type artifact, an artifact that represents the culture. Uh, just like when I found the Clovis culture site, which I'll show you in a subsequent um, slide, 
Uh, I could identify this globus because we found a, a five inch long spearhead that is made exactly in the Clovis style. And because I'm not a Clovis expert, I had it identified by Clovis experts around the country, including uh, Dennis Stanford at our National Museum, and he said it's definitely Clovis. So that, that made me feel better. I wasn't misinterpreting the thing. Um, and again, the significance of that is that that is the oldest site in this area. Could date back to 13,000 to 13,500 years ago because all Clovis sites fall within that time span. And uh, so, and they were obviously using that on big game like the mammoths, mastodons, giant bison that you can see at the Loretta Tarpet Museum, the Page Museum. Uh, so they were hunting big meat packages with that kind of a, of a device. Okay, next please. Okay, this is a map I created with uh, my associate James Flaherty, and it's a, the official tribal territory map. And so this is the land of Kish that extends. The top part's being cut off here a little bit. Um, but uh, up coast from the Topanga area, and as I mentioned before, Topanga is, uh, was a major village on the seacoast. Including the San Fernando Valley, and right in here is a major site. I'm going to show you uh, the Wild West name of it is Burrow Flats. But the Kish uh, name is Jukjanga, and it's a sacred site that we're trying to work very hard with NASA and the Department of Energy to preserve. It's on a former Rocketdyne property that they were testing missiles at. I mean, missile engines, you know, rocket engines. But in the process of doing that for decades, they polluted the ground and everything terribly. And they're going to have a massive cleanup there. And we want to make sure they don't clean away this fantastic site that I'll show you. Uh, so it includes the San Fernando Valley, uh, over to way of Kalinga in here, and to Hung over here, and Pashinga and so on, at uh, San Fernando Mission. Uh, San Fernando being one of the two missions that the Spanish established within Kish territory. It includes San Gabriel Valley, San Bernardino Valley, and of course San Fernando Valley is already mentioned. Coming down the Santa Ana River, crossing the Santa Ana Mountains at Saddleback Mountain. Uh, you know, it's easy to see when you drive down Orange County Saddleback Mountain. Uh, went through apparently the, between the saddle and the Saddleback. Uh, down to Aliso Creek and down to the Marina del Rey, I mean, not Marina del Rey, uh, the, the uh, Laguna Niguel area. And, uh, and then out to sea to encompass the Sea of Kish. And within the Sea of Kish were the four islands. Pamunga or Pimu, this is Catalina Island. Kinkapar, San Clemente Island. Zarashna, San Nicholas Island. Ikunash, which is probably not inhabited, but there's, uh, I believe, burials there, so it's used, utilized for that purpose. Part of the sacred Sea of Kish. And of course, uh, you know, many kids still read today, apparently it's extremely popular, the novel, The Island of the Blue Dolphins. And uh, so that's referring to San Nicholas Island and the so-called lone woman of San Nicholas Island who was abandoned there for 17 years, I believe. Um, and then we put the, the uh, prominent villages on here, like the ones I already mentioned and so on, but not all of them. There are actually a lot of villages. And uh, for example, uh, there was kind of a crazy ethnographer by the name of John Peabody Harrington, who ran around here in the early 1900s, uh, meeting with Native people and getting information from them. And uh, he wrote, uh, you know, an incredible amount. There's 300,000 pages of notes wow. from Southern California Indians. Yeah, that's what I said. Wow. You know, <laughs> you know. And, and uh, on the quiche alone, there's 8,000 pages. And I've seen some of them at the Smithsonian. We went back there to see it. They promised to share it with us. Haven't done it yet, but hopefully they will soon. Uh, a wealth of information in there. And, uh, for example, I saw one page that listed villages for this area, and there's like 50 villages on there. Never heard these names before, so 
They all need to be tracked down. So that gives you some idea of the intense occupation of the area. So these are just prominent villages we have on there, you know, right now. And then uh, what I have, I'm seeing is working that well. This, uh, you know, a map, you call this a compass rose with a north arrow on it, you know? So what I did is I illustrated uh, two things. The concentric rings are from the sacred site of Duke John uh, Burrow Flats, located here. They represent the Gavilino or Quiche universe. And around it, you see these characters that look a little bit like animals, but they're actually people. And at the, the Burrow Flats site, there's two of them. I call them supporters, or like holding up you know, the universe. But in uh, what we have on the map down here, of course you can't read it from out there, um, is part of the origin story of the Kish. And it says that um, in the beginning there was chaos until the great spirit created seven giants. And it says we know their names, they hold up the world. So the Kish had seven atlases, not just one like the Greeks. And, and it said that when they adjust themselves, when they get tired of bowling them, they adjust themselves, we have earthquakes. So well, that's the reason for earthquakes. <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, this, this is the case territory. I have a copy of the map here if you'd like to look at it afterwards. You know, please do. Uh, okay, next. And next. Okay, this is a fairly nice illustration showing uh, typical kind of village. And the Kish had basically two kinds of, of houses, again made with willows for the, uh, you know, the beam, so to speak, and thatching on of tulips and other grasses. Uh, one was dome shaped like this, but there's another that is like a cone of a missile shape, and I'll show you that in a later illustration. Uh, this is showing a village along what I like to think is the San Gabriel River. You see a, a house here under construction and so on. Uh, the Quiche have lived that, they lived that way for thousands of years. Just how long they lived, uh, we don't know. Uh, most archaeologists think it's only a few thousand years. I think it's probably 8,000 years, much longer. And one of the reasons I think that is that some of these cock stones have been dated back to that early time. You know, cock stones are as sacred artifacts as I believe they were for the Kish. One of them was found here, by the way. And so, and you have some on display in your museum, which is nice if you want to go see them. Um, I'd like to actually help with that display if I could, you know, <laughs> and uh, help get the right labels, the Kish name for the artifacts and stuff like that, if that would be okay, I'd like to do that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, got some support here for that. Right. Uh, so they lived in these villages, and really, uh, as all of you I think would agree, this area in general has like the, uh, it's got to be counted as among the best weather in the world. You know, we, uh, I have a colleague, University of Missouri, who's been freezing to death, you know? <laughs> You know, he called me a couple weeks ago and he says, I, you know, I can't drive, it's a blizzard outside, you know, and I still we have 80 degrees here, you know. <laughs> so he's begging for some of that weather back there. Um, and we have what's called a Mediterranean climate, and so uh, it's a fantastic climate, and we have just enough cool weather and rain usually instead of the droughts we've been having the last few years. Uh, and at that time, it was a very lush environment. It's much more lush than it is today, as you, you might imagine. Uh, for instance, you know, Beverly Hills was like a swamp, and Winter and Arrows had a lot of swampy areas and stuff like A lot more water and a lot more trees. And so whatever is still existing today, and, you know, Dr. Poisson is trying to save what little is still left, it's very important to the Quiche to do that, to save the natural environment and save these beautiful plants and animals for all of us. Like P-22, you know who he is? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a mountain lion. And uh, they, they said he killed a, what was it? A koala, yeah, well, sorry about that, but he was hungry, you know? And, 
always looking at his territory, not the other way around, you know? So, but, uh, you know, we have the names of these animals and plants, and we like to, uh, you know, approach the Los Angeles Zoo and say, you know, let's have the land of Kish and show you what the names of the animals are, and some legends about them, which would be kind of neat. For example, the Kish believed that shamans could turn into bears. And the biggest, baddest bear, which doesn't live around here longer, but there's talk about reintroducing them, by the way, uh, the grizzly bear, it's on our flag. <laughs> that's the only way he's still around here now. But he was called Hunar. I, I think that's a cool name. I like Hunar. And so, uh, you know, uh, the, the bears at, uh, at the zoo could be called that. And then I, I, I talked to the director of the uh, Aquarium of the Pacific and we could do an exhibit down there on the Sea of Kish uh, because the, the Kish were heavily adapted to the sea and uh, they exploited everything from the tiny little olivella shells which became beads uh, to abalone which is terrific eating if you've ever had it, you know, it's hard to get anymore but Back in those days, they could, and abalone steaks were fantastic, trust me, you know? And so they were eating very well, and of course, there's a fantastic array of sea fish out there. They're much more colorful than you might imagine, from the golden Garibaldi's, which is close to my name, so I'm you know, partial to that fish, uh, uh, to the sheep's head, you know, the purple and so on. And by the way, I found sheep head bones at the Bar Point site, possibly dating back 13,000 years ago. That means that those Clovis people had boats, and we know they had boats, but this, this is indirect evidence that they had boats, because the only way you can take a sheephead, they, they live like 100 feet underwater. You can't take them on the net. You have to have a hook and line. And uh, so they had that. So that's interesting. You know, that just finding a bone sometimes can tell you about technology in really interesting ways. Okay, next. So this is how they got out to the islands. The Kish and the Chumash are the only native peoples of the New World to have invented this. And what this is, it's a little hard to see here, this is a canoe made out of planks, wooden planks, not a dugout canoe, and not a a reed canoe made of bundles of reeds, like Thor hired all he tried to sail one from Africa to America to sank halfway across, whatever, you know. His theory didn't hold water, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, he also thought that, you know, the island, Easter Island was inhabited by people from South America, but no anthropologist buys that today. The culture is totally uh, Polynesian there. But anyhow, uh, what I admire about him is that he actually sailed a raft from South America to, you know, he missed Easter Island. He sailed further on and hit another island. But at least he hit an island. He survived. Good for him, you know. In those days, they didn't have, you know, GPS or the telecommunication systems we have today or the Internet. So it was very dangerous then. But anyhow, they sailed out there in these plank canoes. And the Spanish were very impressed by them. They said they could hold, some of them could hold up to 30 people. Uh, they could paddle them very fast, they're very pliable, and this is how they communicate with the islands on a steady basis. They constantly traded items from the islands to the mainland, things like abalone, things like uh, sea lion pelts, stuff like that, and in return they get deer meat, you know, and, uh, and grasses to make baskets and stuff like that from the mainland. Uh, sea otter pelts was another one, you know. Uh, women wore uh, skirts made of sea otters on the islands, not on the mainland. On the mainland, they wore grass skirts. Uh, and so it was a different, different system. Now, because the climate was so good here, basically people didn't have to wear a lot of clothes. So the men basically went nude, except that, uh, you know, they had, uh, they had like a jock strap, you know, there's a name for that, which I can't remember right now, you know, but uh, people shocking us today, but not to them then. Uh, excuse me? Breech cloth or loin cloth, yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, you know, here he's wearing a kilt, and some of the, and he's uh, would be a cheaper shaman. 
and then there'd be a headdress like this, uh, a mask of, uh, this would be eagle down here, and these could be raven feathers here, and so on. Uh, and this basic look is what the Chumash had, as well as the, as well as the Quiche and the other Southern California tribes. Very different from the Plains Indians look, or the Eastern Indians uh, look, you know, like the Cherokee and so on, you know. Uh, and women wore grass skirts, as I'll show you with the toy green image. Uh, and children just basically went naked. And it has the Swiss kids do today, by the way. I did work in Switzerland, and they let their kids run naked until, you know, almost puberty. And it's interesting they had that idea. Uh, I'll say, okay, so they communicated uh, religiously and economically. The uh, Kish were very good traders. They were known as master traders. And some of this material from, say, Catalina Island, such as uh, another thing that was traded from the island was steatite or soapstone. With it, they could make bowls. They could make pendants for necklaces. They made figurines of sea life, you know, whales and, uh, and, and the so-called pelican stones and stuff like this. Uh, and these were traded far and wide. Uh, some of the abalone from Canley Island went as far east as New Mexico and the Taos Pueblo. We even have a plan there named after abalone. Uh, so they're getting that from here. So they were master traders and they were extremely influential throughout Southern California, both in terms of trading and so on, but also in terms of religion. Okay, next. And this, unfortunately, is cut off, but this is showing some of their baskets. Uh, for example, this design here, which is in reverse on the dark uh, panels, uh, is the design of the Ketumet. And what a Ketumet is, is this is their mourning ceremony, as in mourning the dead. It was a, the most important ceremony of the case in the last for eight days. And extremely important to them to remember the people who have passed and the elders and so on. And uh, so it, it, it's something that uh, I'd like to revive the basket making uh, tradition if we can, uh, because it's like other California Indian baskets, California Indian baskets in general considered the finest in the world. And the highest price ever paid for a basket in the world was a California basket, made by Dotsola Lee. She's uh, up, up near the uh, uh, central California area. Okay, next. Now this is a basket I told you about from the Smithsonian. Uh, and you see beautiful spiral designs radiating out from a, a central ring. And then you have this ring here. And what I think this ring represents, and I use this ring for the tribal emblem, is I think it represents the Yobar. And the Yobar is a sacred circle. It was a fenced-in circle, maybe the larger in the size of this room or the size of this room. And within it, the Akash would worship their various deities, like Kwa'ar, the, the uh, great spirit, Ta'amet, sun deity, so on. Um, they had an earth mother deity as well, and so on. Uh, these are all being worshipped within the Yobar. Now, anthropologists have tried to call their religion the uh, Chignignish. I don't know if anybody heard of Chignignish. Um, it's not surprising if you haven't, but Chignignish was kind of a messianic kind of deity. He was supposedly was born at the site of Pabunga in Cal State Long Beach. I used to teach down there and walk over and pay my respects to the site of Pabunga. Um, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, you know, Keith Dixon, saved that site. Good for him. Uh, and so supposedly, Chinganesh was born at Tahunga, I mean, uh, Pabunga, excuse me. Uh, he went around like proselytizing, or you know, it's almost like, uh, you know, Christ figure. Uh, 
very effective because not only did he get the Kish to believe in his religious teachings, but also neighboring tribes were joining in on the Jinyingish religion. Uh, the problem with anthropologists want to call the whole religion Jinyingish, and there's much more to religion than just him. But anyhow, uh, he did provide laws and so on, and then he supposedly died like the Jesus figure and ascended to heaven, to the Kish heaven from Pavanga. Okay? Uh, so anthropologists want to call it religion Qing English, but if you've ever seen a print, you can't pronounce it. It's unpronounceable. Uh, and so uh, that's why we came up with Yobar, because Yobar is the name of the ring, and it's much easier to pronounce. But also, it's literally inclusive. It represents the sacred circle within which you know all the religious uh, you know, deities and figures are, are worshipped. So we think it's more appropriate. Okay, next. This is uh, the earliest depiction of San Gabriel Mission. Now, as I mentioned, after they created the original mission at uh, Winter Narrows, they started referring to it as Mission Vieja, the old mission. That's the way it's referred to in the literature. But they moved it five miles north, and there was a branch of the river along here, which I'm trying to show here. You know, well, right. Um, and but there was a village there, and that village is represented by this house here. And notice how tall it is. That's that conical nose cone-like design I told you that they had. They would have those design houses for chiefs, for high-ranking shamans, for council meetings because some of them were large enough to accommodate 50 people. Um, so this is the other design of the house. This represents a village there. And we recently had a controversy on what village was there uh, because some people thought the village of Shabanga or Siba. I don't know if anybody here has ever seen the children's book, Yamano Kwiti, about the uh, careful little boy, you know, Kwiti, Yamano Kwiti. Kwiti means boy in Kish. And uh, it's a charming book and there's a, uh, Nice illustrations. Donna Preble wrote the book about 1940. It was so accurate that the, the great Al Kroger, you know, uh, wrote the introduction and endorsed the book. But anyhow, there's confusion as to what village was here. Uh, some thought that uh, Shivanga or Sipa was here, but the Kish have a tradition that the village of Tobiskanga was located here. And so we had a controversy about that, which was resolved because in the mission documents, the San Gabriel Mission, there's a sheet of paper, 1778 is I think the, I believe the date on it, it mentions the village of Tobiskanga at San Gabriel Mission, and it's signed by Father Sarah. So it's a little hard to argue with that, you know? So we recently uh, applied to have the village of Tobiskanga, the sacred village. And by the way, Tobis, Tobis in Kish language means uh, spiritual. It's a spiritual place. So very appropriate to have it incorporated as a, as a sacred site. And we applied to the state of California uh, Native American Heritage Commission and they approved it. So now we got to straighten out as to what village was, was at the mission. Well, you see, this is a, the church structure and the uh, ancillary structure. And you see these over here, these are the Indian barracks. Uh, where frankly the Indians, which are shown in the foreground here, in the mid foreground, uh, were forced to live. And uh, recently, you know, there was this uh, corridor project about the railroad and went uh, they had this development go right in front of the mission, and uh, and I I thought that was terrible. You know I think they could have uh, done a better job at uh, orchestrating that because they insisted on you know excavating right in front of the mission here, and of course they ran into this, and and as part of it they ran into a cemetery, you know, with lots of burials that were 
my book, Desecrated. Uh, and uh, so the tribe is, you know, been trying to sort that out and have them respectfully reburied and so on. But uh, it's a shame that they had to be disturbed in the first place. You know, I've worked in Switzerland, I've worked in Greece, I've worked in other enlightened countries where this sort of thing would never go on, you know? They, they value their history and their archaeology and they preserve it. They find other ways to preserve it, you know, not destroy it. Uh, anyhow, this is an 1822 painting by Ferdinand Depp, the earliest depiction of the Kish and earliest depiction of San Gabriel Mission. You see, and this, by the way, is Mount Baldy back there. And you actually don't see Mount Baldy looking that direction, but he threw it in because he liked it. <laughs> and Mount, he knows Mount Baldy, if you can see it here, it has snow on it. And indeed, whenever it first snows around here, it always snows on Mount Baldy first. Uh, and the Kish name for Mount Baldy is Jawat, which, by the way, means snow mountain. You know? So uh, I, I just been talking to Forest Service. Uh, they have a little visitor center up there in Mount Baldy Village, and they want to redo it. So we're going to help them redo it right, you know, and get some of this in there. Interestingly, uh, my associate James would help me do the map. Uh, he finally got married. I never thought he would, but he finally got married. You know. In his 50s, so there's still hope for anybody 50 out there hasn't been married yet. Um, married a school teacher, and she lives in Mount Baldy Village. And so when I connected with them, uh, she had pictures of bighorn sheep near her house. And I didn't know bighorn sheep still existed there. And so I, I went and I started seeing more and more pictures and everything. And I thought, wow, you know, it's fantastic that these animals are still surviving in the mountains there. And they're like the Kish, they're survivors. You know, I thought they'd been extinct there and they only found them further south, you know, in the greater Palm Springs area. But, uh, uh, but anyhow, the bighorn sheep was called Aat, and they live, they still live on Joat. And so I asked the uh, California Department of Fish and Game if we could have a skull of uh, the bighorn sheep. Uh, for ceremonial purposes and so on. They kindly granted one, and this skull was from a bighorn sheep that was killed on Mount Baldy by a cougar, you know, a mountain lion. And when the ranger found the skull, it was being scavenged by a hunar, a black bear, you know. And so three major animals are associated with that. And so uh, we had that uh, skull on display at the Homestead Museum. Thanks. To uh, uh, the Kish uh, media man, uh, Tim McGill. Uh, and I have the Forest Service interested in maybe displaying it again at the Bob Aldi Visitor Center, which I think would be great. And I'm, uh, it's a little bit of a vested uh, interest for me because I took a nice shot of Bob Baldi with snow on it and I used that as a backdrop, you know? And people seem to like it, so I hope they still like it for, when we display it there at the museum or the visitor center, I should say. Okay, next. Another shot of San Diego Mission. Actually, this is a painting by Edwin Deacon, and he worked basically in the 19th uh, century. And he, he made, in my opinion, the finest set of paintings of all the California missions. And I used, uh, when I was excavating the San Buena Matura Mission, I used this painting in San Buena Matura as well. Beautiful paintings. There's a book with his paintings in it if you're interested. Okay, next. Now, this is the sacred site I was telling you about of uh, Burl Flats, the Wild West name, but the king's name is Duke John. And what's really interesting is this is the gantries for the rocket testing that they had. And there's a gantry near, I think a subsequent slide will show that, uh, near the sacred site. This is uh, a cave painting site. This is inside of a, of a cave, or uh, archaeologists like to call them rock shelters. And interestingly, this site, according to Dr. Edwin Krupp, who's the director you know, of the Griffith Observatory, uh, he's published a book on ancient astronomies, and he mentions this site as one of the sites in the book. It's the only Indian site in California that has both a winter and summer solstice monuments at it. So it's fantastic. 
and I'll show you in the subsequent slide next. Okay, this, these are these five rings I was telling you about before that's on the tribal emblem. And this is one of the supporters here. It's a little hard to see him, but he's there holding on to it. Uh, let's have the next slide. That's a NASA slide, by the way. You want to get credit here. Okay, now, uh, this is Tim Miguel and uh, maybe Andy, I can't tell from this angle. Um, the tribal chairman, and they're close to the entrance to the cave, and there's a gantry. You see how close it is. Uh, so uh, we're very concerned that they don't damage this site in their cleanup operation, and we've been having sort of a go around on this. You know, it's, it's not straightforward. Next. Okay, so this is actually a painting of uh, Chumash uh, Shaman, uh, painting his designs on a cave wall. And you can actually see this site. It's uh, in the San Marcos Pass between Santa Barbara and uh, Solvang. So as you go up the mountain, it had, there's actually a sign that says painted cave, you know. And you can go there and see this site. Uh, the site is protected. It has iron bars across it, so you can't hurt it. And I'm glad they have that. Uh, but these designs are on it, and the Chumash painted a fantastic <coughs> picture as well. We see he's painting with various pigments from a small little stone bowl. Uh, and those pigments would be red ochre, which is iron oxide, or hematite, or other colors that they could naturally get. And these things last thousands of years. The colors were very durable, much better than Papco paints or whatever today, you know? So uh, uh, they did impressive work with that. Next, please. And this is showing at this site would be conducted ceremonies like this. This is from Donna Preble's book, Yamano Kwiti, which the tribe likes. And uh, so dancing among the American Indians is not a social thing like it is for Europeans or Americans. It is a religious thing. And so it's very important to express religiosity through movement. And I think it's beautiful, you know. And I've witnessed a lot of them across the country, like Hopi Kachina dances and so on. Uh, so they're very, if you get a chance to see them, they're very special events. Next, please. So this is the entrance to the cave. The cave is actually, it's not deep, it's, it's uh, about 15, 20 feet long. And so it has a roof-like element to it. But you see this notch. This notch was artificially carved. It was not original. And they did it on purpose because, next. And this is looking into it, you see the paintings inside. This has been identified as a case site because that rake-like hand or foot is typical of case imagery. And here's another one over here. The concentric circle design is to the left over here. So through this notch, next. Uh, okay, uh, let's go forward one and come back to this one. <laughs> next, and then we'll come back. Okay, one more, and then hopefully I'll have what I want. Okay, this is the one that the marker goes into, the five concentric circles with the supporters here and so on. Next. Okay. This is uh, from our book, and it's not the complete image, unfortunately, but what happens on the winter solstice, around December 21st, 22nd, depending on the year, beams of light shine through a notch, shine through that notch I told you about. They form a wedge of light, this wedge of light. And, and archaeologists call these things sun daggers. And the sun dagger enters into the concentric circles on the winter solstice. So it's a marker, I think a fantastic marker. So in the cool of winter, you have the warmth of the light and the sun you know, moving into and marking it. So then I'll go back. One more. OK. Uh, I'll get to the other marker in a bit, but I want to explain this to you. This is more imagery of the Kish purpose for the site. 
this tall thing right here, and there's one here, it's a little hard to see in this photograph. Uh, another concentric circles here. At the top of it is a comet head. And same thing over here. And then these rounded elements going up it, uh, these represent what's called cotumid poles. They erected these poles at burial sites to honor a, a chief or a shaman. And they believe that prominent ones could turn into comets. So this is completely iconography of, of the Kish. So, okay, go to the next one. And this is showing, you see the comet head there, and this is the tail of the comet. And it's supported by the Kutuma pole. These are the baskets stacked up on the Kutuma pole. They stack up beautiful baskets on that as offering to the prominent uh, person. Next. And I'm going to show that next. Next. Okay. Unfortunately, this is a grainy shot of mine, but um, it's, it comes off better in the book. Uh, on the summer solstice, you have an opposite kind of uh, marker. There's a long, about a 10 foot long wedge shaped boulder. It's about as high as this podium here. And as the sun rises on the summer solstice, you know, June 21st or so on, uh, it doesn't form a marker of light, it forms a marker of shadow. And that shadow creeps in and goes into the largest of five mortar holes that's in a pattern that is called a bear paw pattern. And interestingly, as I mentioned before, it was believed that shamans could turn into bears, so this could be uh, why this happens. But this is a summer solstice monument. This is the only site in California that has both. It's fantastic. And it absolutely has to be preserved. Okay, next. So we had a rededication ceremony. This is Tribal Chairman Andrew Salas here. Next. And this is him. This is Chief uh, Ernie Salas and other members. Next. And so on. Next. And he's standing in front. Now he's, he's in a, what's called a greeter pose, and there's images of figures inside in that same pose with outstretched hands. We call them the greeters. Next. And another one of Chief Ernie and Chairman Andrew. Next. And uh, so it was a very nice ceremony and uh, rededicated to the, you know, the religious system of the Kish. Next. Now this is a design I came up with, um, which some people like. Uh, what I'd like to see is every city within Kish territory erect a bronze Kutuma pole like this. And then there's an inverted basket at the top, and that's the way that the Katuma poles were made. And they have a display of feathers at the very top. But this would be a durable bronze, and it will commemorate the fact that the tribe was present in all these cities, you know? I almost got one into, um, you know, Eagle Rock, but it didn't quite make it, so I, I hope we can still do it somewhere. Okay, next. Now this is uh, a version of one that was made by Tim McGill, this, this guy here, at the Homestead Museum. And so these represent the baskets. Okay, next please. Now, uh, getting to the present and the future. Uh, what we'd like to do is celebrate, as I mentioned before, this hero of the Kish. Now we wrote a book about her. As I mentioned before, Troy Perina and Henry has a few books back there to sell if you're interested. The Joan of Arc of California. And doing research for this book, we found out she's the only Native American woman that ever led a revolt. Indeed, the only woman that ever led a revolt in American history. So she's unique in American history. But prior to our book, she was only written about by white male historians. Now, being an archaeologist, I hope there's no historians here because <laughs> I have a bias against historians when they write about Indians. They tend to mess it up. <laughs> so, prior to us, there's only articles about her written by these historians, and they literally called her, you know, a witch, a sorceress, a seductress, 
all this nonsense. She was a religious freedom fighter. She was a shaman, daughter of a chief, and she put together a little army from six villages to expel the Spanish. So we call her the Joan of Arc of California because her stories are very identical. Uh, she organized this little army, marched on San Gabriel Mission to expel these brutal Spanish. And I'm gonna get to how brutal they are here in a second. Uh, but like Joan of Arc, she was betrayed. And so when she got to the mission, she was, uh, you know, there was an ambush, she was arrested. And then like Joan of Arc, she was subjected to a sham trial. And this trial was so important that the governor of Spanish California, Pedro Fages, came all the way down from uh, Monterey, the colonial capital, um, to preside at the trial. And his uh, trial of hers, you know, he, dev he devised 10 questions, and uh, we, we call him a minor masterpiece, you know, of um, a coercive, you know, interrogation. Because uh, every question was designed to, at the same time, belittle her and the tribe, convince them that they were totally wrong, that the Spanish system was better, uh, and religion, and also convince them of the invincibility of the Spanish. So it was hardly a fair trial, and the outcome was already you know, known before he conducted this thing. Uh, but then uh, people have asked me, did they burn her at the stake, like Joan of Arc? And by the way, this is during the time of the Spanish Inquisition, the worst assault on people in Europe, and only eclipsed by the Nazis, you know? How many people were tortured and murdered? And it was completely within keeping with the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, they, they have a, a book, Doctorum, you know, Inquisitorum. And then there, they, you know, one of the punishments is burning at the stake, you know? And it's incredible to us today. Um, but, they, but I think Pedro Fages decided not to burn her at the stake. He didn't want to make her a martyr like Joan of Arc. So what did he do? His punishments maybe to her were worse. He forced her to divorce her Indian husband and marry a Spaniard, and not just any Spaniard, he was a Spanish soldier, obviously to keep her in line. Then he banished her to the northernmost mission and get her out of the way, which at the time for us is charming Carmel, but for her it must have seemed like Siberia, you know? And then a, a, she had children by a Spanish soldier, and then she contracted one of the Spanish diseases, probably smallpox, and died and is buried at another mission up there, San Juan Bautista Mission, along with 4,000 other Indians in an unmarked grave. That's something we'd like to correct, you know? She's a hero, she deserves to be treated as such. And so we're designing, we've designed a statue for her that a wonderful artist, Rick Hill, has made. And the city of San Gabriel has agreed to let us put the statue up. We, we have to raise money for it, so we're in the process of doing that. So if any of you are interested, we have a website. Uh, and uh, this will be, a, it'll be a full-size statue of her. See the next image, we have an image of her full-size now. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, he did a wonderful job, and she's wearing a traditional costume, totally, the, the fiber a grass skirt, beads, including a, a pendant. That pendant is actually part of the collection at uh, the Southwest Museum, part of the Autry. And she's wearing an eagle feather cape, which shamans were allowed to do. In fact, at Burl Flats, there are shamans depicted with, with uh, eagle feather capes. Okay. What I want to read to you is a couple of quotations to indicate what these people went through. And one of them is uh, this is a uh, statement by uh, our governor, Jerry Brown. He did it on November 25th in 2015. And he said, California has been home to human beings for at least 12,000 years. But with my PowerPoint slide, I would say 13,000, but whatever. Uh, with a period of European-American settlement representing only a tiny fraction of that time. Um, 
The first Europeans to arrive in California encountered hundreds of thousands of people organized into hundreds of distinct tribes. They flourished in the bountiful hills and valleys of what would someday become the Golden State. The contact between these first Californians and successive waves of newcomers over three succeeding centuries was marked by the utter devastation of Native American people. And here's an example. The newborn state of California institutionalized, institutionalized violence that had the population in just two years. The newborn state of California uh, forced relocation of Indian people and left no tribe intact. <clears throat> in his 1851 address to the legislature, our first governor, American governor, I would say, Peter Hardiman Burnett stated, quote, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the two races until the Indian race becomes extinct, must be expected. That's the first American governor of California. And I think it's despicable. Then this is from uh, Father Sugranus. I mentioned his book, The Old San Gabriel Mission in 1909. And this was the attitude displayed, you know. Um, he's talking about the fact that Spanish soldiers were raping the Indian girls. This, this occurred very frequently. And he said, the reprehensible conduct of the soldiers related above. This at once created a strong animosity in the hearts of the savages, he calls them savages, towards the missionaries. The Indians, the Indians conceived, this is the case, the Indians conceived the idea that rapine was the primary purpose of the mission's existence. How about that? Not the religious con con conversion of them. And then he goes on to state this. It must, again, it must not be forgotten that our fathers dealt with wild and barbarous tribes in a country where the light of civilization had never shone. These people were full of superstitions and were engaged in an almost perpetual warfare among themselves. It's not true. Californians were very peaceful. You know? The Indians persisted stubbornly in their heathen customs and practices, making it extremely difficult for the missionaries to persuade them to a different and better life. So this is the attitude that's been displayed to them, you know, for 250 years, and it's still being displayed because right now we're having a battle with the U.S. Navy uh, who want to take 500 burials that they dug up on Zoroshna, you know, San Nicholas Island, and remove them to China Lake, you know, the naval base up in the desert area, you know, to the east of the Sierras. Uh, into the tribal area of the Paiutes, and I've talked to the Paiutes, and they don't want them there. It's an insult to them, and uh, you know it's inhuman. And then they allegedly found, and I find it suspicious, uh, 500 sacred artifacts, as, as if each burial had one artifact with it, uh, and they want to take them up there as well. So they they've uh, exhibited complete disdain and disregard for the Kish. They want to have these 500 burials reburied on the island with human dignity and respect as well as the artifacts. I think any reasonable person would agree with that. And so my cousin used to be in the office of the Pacific Command. Uh, he's trying to get the Admiral to stop this atrocity. And it's just another example of how they're being mistreated. Okay? Now I'll give you one more example because I'm over my little time limit here and I want to have time for questions. Um, you're aware that they created a new national monument up here in the mountains. And so the president did that. And as part of it, they reached out, fortunately, to the cage to get input on how to properly treat the ancient sites up there. And one of them is what I call the Big Rock Pictograph Site. It has it's probably the most important site aside from Burl Flats or Jujangna. And it has wonderful paintings in red on it. Uh, the boulder is, is about 15 feet long, about six feet high. It is the first monument 
of people in what has become the new national monuments. So you think the government would have protected it and would have provided safe for both the tribe and all of us, right? No. They changed the course of the San Gabriel River so it flowed over the boulder and hit it with boulders and other <laughs> debris, you know, which, you know, during El Nino years uh, happens a lot. And to the point where all the paintings are faded, you can't see them anymore. And then parts of the boulder, quote, had broken off because they hit it with bulldozers and channelizing the thing continually, you know? Uh, and then to make matters worse, some gangs have gone up there and spray painted graffiti all over. So it's like totally desecrated. So I recently had meetings with a Forest Service archaeologist. He's on board with me to try to you know, restore and protect this site. And I spoke with the Getty Research Conservation Institute, and they're willing to meet with us because they can provide all the expertise, you know, and the ability, they have all the money they need, you know, to do this right, to preserve the site and restore it for all of us. And, uh, and we'd like to, you know, build a little pavilion or something with information to explain um, how important these sites were to the original people here. For example, and I'll end with this, the Kish origin story. The first people that came here, and they came from the east, as archaeologists think, they came from the east and occupied this greater area. And they had many chiefs, but there was a great chief, the chief of chiefs, his name was Weald. And when he died, he was interned in the Big Bear Lake. But when the first people of the Kish died, they became the pine trees in our forests. The living pine trees are the living ancestors, which I think is beautiful. That's the sort of thing we'd like to present, you know, in this little visitor center thing. So we hope you will support us in that, and uh, thank you very much. So if anybody's interested in getting a book, please see Henry, and he'll raise his hand again. Um, and uh, I'll entertain any questions anybody would like to ask. Yes. The painting, you have one painting of the dance. Uh, what's the earliest time to where the, the European painters started trying to document accurately? That would be the sun. Uh, 18th century, 1700s, but not around here. Uh, a few cases. There was a Frenchman that painted some of the uh, Indian tribes um, up around the San Francisco Bay area, for example. You know, um, and so there's a few images like that, but they're extremely rare. You know, so specifically that painting. Uh, Oh, that was done by Anna Preble, and she did that in 1940, so that's just a recent one. But it's pretty accurate. I mean, she, she did her homework. She got a few things wrong, but, you know, for a layman uh, writing a novel, I, I'm very impressed, you know. So uh, the, the tribe likes it, so if you want to read it, it's, you know, if you can find it. I, I was given a copy by the tribe, it's on, you know, they bought it off eBay, you know, so it's possible. Yes. Good, good question. And the uh, thing is, generally, yes. You know, there's genetics and there's blood types that link, you know, all the native peoples of the New World. But there are differences as well, you know, because they've been here for thousands of years. I mean, the current estimate is 20,000, 30,000 years ago for the first entry into the New World. That's enough time to develop, you know, genetic differences. You know, to, um, but yes, they can identify, you know, whether you're a native, have native, you know, a heritage from the New World versus, you know, Europe or Asia or Africa, something like that. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, Beverly Boulevard uh, ends on the east, goes somewhere around San Gabriel, San Gabriel River area. Now, so on the west, uh, it goes past Beverly Hills at one time. 
field. So which, uh, which way did the Bear People of the Wire continue to start? West or from the east? I'm, I'm talking about going way back to 1930s, 1920s. Um, I was just born in 1944 at Glendale. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You know, if you talk about the Indian Trail, maybe I can help you there, but uh, you know, not with that. I, I live near Fairplay Boulevard, actually, mid, mid LA area, so. Yes? I just want to make a statement. The artifacts that you mentioned that's in our museum were actually dug up in, in, in an archaeological site in the city of Glendora. Yes. And I There's a report on I saw they have a report on display, which I was very impressed with, by the way. Great. I think they should. I've never seen a report in a display before, and I thought that's great, you know? So, Henry. Yes, uh, I just want to mention another battle that we're fighting, and we you mentioned the Whitty Narrows area. Uh, right now, it's untapped to be desecrated. It's a former city of Hukna, a village of Hukna, and it's, it's, it's also registered with the Native American Heritage Commission as sacred ground. And they want to build a 14,000 square foot museum with a 112 car parking lot with bus turnouts and a makeshift pond. Um, they've been pushing this for about eight years now, but we've been trying to fight and fight to preserve it and save it. And uh, any support you, we can get from you, um, because once that is gone, the ecological area, the ecological system of the area will be gone. And it's a very, very popular place for bird watchers. The Audubon Society, if you go there Saturday morning, there's all over you birds and walking around. So uh, you go out to contact uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. They're very well aware of it. Uh, the Board of Supervisors, specifically uh, Elvis Solis, and uh, the Rivers Mountain Conservancy. They're the ones that work with the JPA the whole program. Thanks, Henry. Yeah. It's uh, Cache Mama King, the sacred center of the Cache. A museum for what? Uh, for water, like we really need a museum for water. Where's the water? <laughs> We're having trout right now. Um, Natural History Museum, it isn't simply water? Well, they're, they're trying to broaden it, but its original function was... No, I don't think so at all. Yeah, well. My daughters have gone there numerous times for their classes at the Natural History Teaching Area. No, it is now. It's been that for years. Yes, it has, and, and the tribe wants to keep it that way. The building is a 1920s building and was moved in there. It's now falling apart from termites and rot. It's held together by paint. It's, it's totally inadequate for any of the teaching functions it had done those. The wall adjacent is a commercial wall of brick in behind. All the trees are nursery trees right now. No, there's many plants there. In fact, the tribal uh, biologist, Matthew Titimus, has gone there and, and uh, taught children, you know, teach them about the plants that she and the acorns and so on that were utilized by the, by the case. And uh, he's really great with children. And the, the, the Nature Center is open almost 365 days out of the year. And if it is in that much disrepair, it wouldn't be. Uh, up to date, it, it would be it would be condemned by the uh, oh, building no. department. That's not true about being held up by paint. Yes, way back there. Right. Yeah. Are there any courses in the teaching language? No, unfortunately, like most Californians, um, and unlike my Hopi friends, Navajo friends who still speak their language, um, the Kish lost their language. And uh, it's a shame because there's a lot of beautiful words as I've been mentioning and so on. Uh, what we're doing right now, and Arthur back there is helping me, uh, we're doing a comparative vocabulary list. And so all these different ethnographers that have been recording the words you know, back in the 19th and early 20th century, we're putting all those words together to see what commonalities there are so we know what words are probably the right ones, like Queedy for boy, or Hunar for grizzly bear, and that sort of thing. But he keeps finding more vocabularies. He just found some in this past week. Uh, so it's an ongoing process. But that's going to help. We hope to turn out a little book on that, so if you're interested in, in the words or things, you know, we'll turn out a book on that. Yes? Can you share with us more about the artifact that found on our property 
Yes. Mention, mention who you are. And, My name is Jeff Michelson. I live in Glendora and we live adjacent to a property, the Gordon Mall property they're looking to develop. And I found that adjacent to a proposed fill site development. And what's the significance and what can we do? Would there be other artifacts similar to that in those fill sites? Well, thanks for bringing it. Um, this is called, American archaeologists use the Spanish term matate for this. It's a milling stone for grinding, you know, acorns or seeds. Uh, <clears throat> we use a small stone called a mono, and uh, I know the case names for this. I can't remember them, but I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but um, these frequently are found on village sites. And uh, it's a portable matai. There's some that are ground into big boulders, and those are permanent. But this is a portable one, believe it or not, somebody carried it around. And uh, I don't know if it's a, you know, a, a, a husband that needed to behave and carry this thing around or what, but uh, it's pretty heavy, you know, if you pick it up. Uh, the other one here is a, it's a small little pestle, um, but it, it's had a double purpose, as I can see, because I, I, forgot, I didn't pick up this side of it. This side of it shows that it was partially ground <clears throat> as a mono. So this would have been used on the larger one because this won't fit in here. So they would have a larger matati for this. And, uh, but it was also used as a pestle to pound vertically because there's damage marks on the end here. We archaeologists recognize these things. And they would use it in a, a mortar, a bowl like the one on the table over there. Uh, that would have a very big pestle with that one. This would be with a much smaller bowl or uh, mortar. And, and these were, uh, again, you know, these were uh, food processors, you know, the original food processors around here have utilized for a variety of plants that uh, were very nutritious. For example, uh, chia is extremely nutritious. And uh, so that's something that the tribe actually hopes to to market again, so thank you for bringing these. Yeah, can you mention one thing about that used to be a, a hole? Oh yes, yeah, thank you. Well you notice this is missing, this part right here, it's broken off, and uh, it's a very old brick if you look at it, um, and frequently we find these, uh, archaeologists call them killed artifacts, meaning they're damaged or broken, in the southwest they have beautiful bowls and they break them, you know, and they break them and they bury them with the deceased. So they're usually the property or assumed to be the property of the deceased. And it's a way of putting their material culture with them to show them respect. So the fact this was broken like this makes me suspicious. There might be burials at that site. You know, you know just like at the Burl Platt site, remember I mentioned the Katuma pole designs? Katuma poles are at burial sites, so I suspect there's gonna be a cemetery there. And I've been trying to get the government to do methods like I've used, like ground penetrating radar to find the burials, because I, I suspect they're there, you know. Do you want to say something, Arlen? Okay, he's, he's helping me out here, as he usually does. Okay, the pestle is apaho, and the mortar is tokoyas. I'll put this here, though. So. <clears throat> Well, oh, that's an ongoing thing, you know. I, I think there's any tribe that likes the BIA, you know. Yeah. You know, but the Navajo, there's a word, Diné. Yes, that, that's her preferred name, by the way. You mean the people that Navajo is only? Or? Yeah, just Navajo. Okay. Right. Yeah, but they like to be called by who they are. Right, just like the kings like to be called by who they are and uh, something else. Now, BIA stands for Bureau of Indian Affairs, if you don't know that, um, and virtually every tribe in America, you know, dislikes them with a passion, you know. I mean, even Native American would be better than, you know. Yes, and the thing is they have this ridiculous system for approving whether a tribe is, you know, federally recognized or not, uh, and they, they make people go through many hoops on this thing. And it takes years and years when it shouldn't. 
If you have the evidence, it should happen in a reasonable amount of time. And it is so bad, and I think you're going to be shocked by this. Uh, every time I ask students, like in UCLA when I teach or something, who are the most famous American Indian women? I always get the same answer. You can tell me tonight, right? Who? Pocahontas. Pocahontas. It's not okay? Do you know that Pocahontas' tribe only got thorough recognition last year? Mm. Now, the best known tribe, or one of the best known tribes in American history, and they had a long history before America became America, you know? And only got it last year. Uh, the Palatons, they have another name. You know? But in history books, they're called the Palatons, and Chief Palaton, and all that sort of thing. Yes? Yes. And lived in relatively low conflict. Yes. Any ideas on uh, how they all got together? Uh, California Indians were peaceful. On the other hand, they did have a war bow and stuff like this. So, if, you know, if, you, if somebody steals somebody's wife or something, this led to conflict. Okay? Uh, just like Helen of Troy. <laughs> it won't happen, you know. Uh, but in the main, they're very peaceful. And, and the Spanish and the Russians, you know, who conquered the area north of San Francisco, you know, the Russian River and so on, Port Ross, uh, they took advantage of this. And so when the Spanish first came here, the Kish gave them food, they gave them presents and stuff, and they took that to be weakness and, you know, they just went and enslaved them all the more, you know. Uh, now, one of the ways they handled aggression, sometimes they did not wipe by each other, but it's pretty rare. But they had another thing that I thought was interesting. They had these verbal battles. And there's a famous one in the literature between a, a, a village on Catalina Island and one in this area, okay? And they would get together and yell insults at each other. They would sing them and stuff like this. And this is how they got it out, apparently, you know? And this is really interesting to me because this is what New Guinea Islanders do today. They, they, they have these verbal battles, you know? So uh, there's different ways of dealing with your, your problems, I guess, you know? But, uh, yes? Um, I don't know I'm wondering if you know anything about um, the area called Glendale Narrows, River Park. Um, Yeah, I may not, but the tribal chairman probably does, Andrew Salas. So if you want to come up and show me the area, I'll, I'll show it to him. And um, were there horses in the, their culture? No. Those, those came from the Spanish. Yeah, horses came from Europe. Interestingly, we used to have horses during the proverbial ice age, but they died out. And then they were reintroduced by the Europeans. And then, of course, <clears throat> the famous Plains Indians, you know, were, became master horsemen, you know. Uh, but yeah, no, they, they were recent introductions. When the Spanish brought them in here, I'm sure they were frightening to the Indians. I mean, you know, never seen anything like that before, you know. Just as we would be if we saw a giant squid, for example, you know, which uh, I understand do exist, and there's a documentary about it, I haven't seen it yet. A squid, by the way, as long as this room, I mean, you know, they're, they've been recorded as that long. And so, uh, you know, uh, but fortunately they look deep in the sea. They usually don't come to, near the surface, but it would, it would be a pretty exciting beach trip if they did. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes? So the Keish and the other uh, tribes were mostly nomadic and they went by foot everywhere, including to the shore and for trading and so all by foot, right? Yes. But not all by foot, but um, you have to use the word nomadic in the right context because in anthropology it means a, a people that migrate around to different places, okay? And the Kish didn't have to do that. They had these major villages, which I have my map here. Uh, they wouldn't have to necessarily leave. They had support sites, you know, like in the fall, they go to acorn groves, they get the acorns. 
you know, certain times of year you can get shellfish, but not during certain kinds of year when they're toxic, you know. Uh, and, and you find shells from the sea around here, pectin shells and keone and abalone and stuff like that. So that shows you the trade they had. Now they did it on foot and they had burden baskets that they could put on their backs to carry a lot of things. They're big conical baskets you can put on, the, on your back with a strap that goes around your forehead. It's called a tump line. Uh, they had that, but they also had canoes. They had three different kinds of canoes. Uh, for the inland rivers, like San Gabriel River, they had reed canoes, and they also had dugouts. But in the sea, they had the teots, you know, the plank canoes. So they could sail those boats up and down the streams. You know. So they, they had both ways of doing it. They didn't, they didn't have any draft animals. They couldn't hop on a deer and ride around or anything. You know. Or an animal. There used to be animals around here, too. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much.